as it relates to Kaepernick, though, here's here's my here's my broader concern, because from the moment he became a free agent in 2017, I I sense that the NFL collectively was going to keep him out of the game. That that we started seeing arguments from media, arguments that had been planted by people from the league negatives about Colin Kaepernick, reasons why he shouldn't be signed. And it was all bullcrap. But it all supported this idea that he didn't deserve, based on merit, a spot in the NFL. And he clearly did deserve a spot in the NFL. He clearly did deserve an opportunity to at least compete to be a starter somewhere. At some point, however, Peter, I think it became a cat and mouse kind of a game between the league and Colin Kaepernick. And maybe it was the 2019 workout that fell flat when both sides were to blame for the haggling over the release that the league wanted Kaepernick to sign. And Kaepernick thought that it was too broad and it potentially would take away legal rights. He still has to this day to have a second claim against the NFL for collusion motivated by retaliation against him for the first collusion claim that forced them to pay between five and ten million dollars. That that is a viable claim. To the extent people think he's litigious, he is restrained from pursuing what would be a very viable claim for collusion based on retaliation. But the concern was in November of twenty nineteen, from his perspective, they were trying to get him to sign away those rights. Both sides, both sides were setting each other up. That was the feeling. It was kind of like Let's, we haven't made a Seinfeld reference yesterday. It was kind of like the time George was driving the in-laws. Well, his would have been in-laws because his, his fiance died while licking toxic envelopes for their wedding invitations. But I digress. And he pretended he had a house in the Hamptons and they knew he didn't. So both sides were just doing this. Let's push this to the brink. I feel like at some point with the NFL and Kaepernick, it's become this. This, they pretend to be interested, but they're really not. And they know the other side isn't interested, so they pretend they're interested to flesh out the other side. And it never really gets to the point where somebody has to make a big move. Because this would be easy. Offer him a one-year deal for the veteran minimum. No one's ever done that because there's an element of fear there that he would take it just to call their bluff. And he never comes out and says, hey, I would just take a one-year minimum deal for fear of someone calling his bluff. And I feel like that's what it became after the first couple of years. It's no longer about Colin Kaepernick wanting to play football, and it's no longer about a team looking for a green light from someone who otherwise may be upset that they would do this. And and it became about NFL and Kaepernick jockeying for position in this game that they're playing of we really are interested, but we really aren't. But we, we want to create the impression that we kind of are, but there's only so far that we're going to go, if that makes any sense whatsoever. Yeah, look, in my opinion, and look, far be it for me to say what I would do if I were Colin Kaepernick. I don't know how Colin Kaepernick could expect anybody to offer him, what does he expect, a, a, a $2 million signing bonus and then X, Y, and Z? I mean, if I were him, I would, I'm seriously, I'm serious. If he really wants to play football right now, if I were him, I would say, just bring me in for the veteran minimum, you know, and then let's see what happens. Um, and and in, because look, anybody who hasn't played football for this long, you're just assuming that the rust is going to be too much to knock off. That's got to be the assumption. And if you really want to play football, that's what I'd do if I... Hey, look, if I had been unemployed for five years and I was dying to get back into it, I would be saying, man, just let me back in the game. But again, none of us have talked to Colin Kaepernick in, in years. You know, Mike, what I thought was really one of the most interesting things I've done, whatever, in the back nine of my career, uh, in 2013, when I started the MMQB, uh, at Sports Illustrated, this this little microsite at SI. One of the things that we did at the start of the, of the site, I convinced the 49ers, because at the time, Kaepernick was a huge name in this game. You know, he had just come off the Super Bowl and, and, and all that. And, and he agreed to let me go with him 
to Turlock, California, uh, which is about 90 minute drive from Santa Clara, maybe two hours. And I interviewed him on the way there and on the way back to Santa Clara. And it was, you know, we talked about everything, everything. And what I'll never forget ever is the fact that when we got there, a bunch of police officers at that time, and this is before any of all this stuff had happened. These, these cops who were just doing security both at graduation and it was crazy to have Colin Kaepernick there. So there was a lot of hubbub around him. And one of the cops basically was showing him his tattoos and they were talking about tattoos for 15 or 20 minutes. And I just, after everything that has happened, I think back to that day and I think how interesting it, it is that he felt such a kinship to the guys that day who were protecting him. And it's such a complex thing, the life and times of Colin Kaepernick. And it's amazing, that's nine years ago, what, you know, sitting down with him for, and being around his family too, for six or eight hours total. But I remain convinced to this day that I think, I think that if someone had signed him 2017, 2018, that it could have worked out because I, and I'm not saying it absolutely would have, I'm not, but I'm saying that I think when it came time to play football, he was really going to try to be a great player because he loves football. He happens to love these social issues just as much, but isn't that okay? Don't other football players that you know and have heard of love things either almost as much as football or maybe even a little bit more so? And that's why I really will always wonder, what if? Well, I want to approach it from a slightly different perspective. And I want to ask anyone out there who may be watching or listening, either on Peacock, Sirius XM 85, Podcast, Sky Sports, wherever. And if you are, thank you very much for that. But Let's put our sh ourselves in our own jobs, whatever our career choice is, whatever it is, whatever you're doing for a living. Let's say that in your line of work, your chosen profession, you have accomplished great things. You have set yourself up for promotions, pay raises. You have reached the pinnacle of your profession. Then, because you said or did something that you believed was right, and that you had every right to do. You had ever you were acting within your legal rights. You were acting within the confines of the rules that applied to you. You did nothing wrong. You are prevented from working at this job at which you have become a star. For not one year, but five years. And now, now after all that. They want you to come back and work for minimum wage. They want you to come back and act like an entry-level guy. Or maybe, maybe you should really prove that you love the thing at which you were so good by going to play in the USFL, the XFL, the AAF, or somewhere else for minimum wage. Their version of minimum wage, which is far less than the other version of minimum wage. So when you look at it from that perspective, Peter, if it was me... I'd be damn pissed off and I wouldn't want to do it. Why should I have to do it? You deprived my career from me. You took away my career in my prime. And now to prove that I really love the thing that you stole from me, I have to work for peanuts. Get the hell out of here with that. I mean, it is not to prove it is not. It's not to prove that you love it. It's to prove. I, I mean, how, how good is that? You can still do it after not doing uh, it know. for five years. But I shouldn't have to do that because I've already done that. I've already climbed the mountain. And look, I understand what you're saying. For football, it's different because he ha because they've successfully blackballed him for five years. So now he does have to prove to himself and everyone else he can still do it. That's a tough mental hurdle to get over. Just the fact that even if it's right, and you're and I agree with you, 
I'm just saying if I'm the guy – but it's Mike, wrongfully okay. had my career let taken me, away from let me. me. Let I, me I ask, I, I'm going to have a hard time doing that. Let me ask this question. Let me just ask you this. Suppose you're the Steelers. And suppose you, you do a contract that basically says, hey, look, if you make our team, okay, if, if you, you know, draw this so that you get, a like a final 53 roster bonus you know do whatever on labor day weekend or or, you know whenever the you know the rosters are solidified and then at the end of the year if you would if you started x games there's whatever you know eight million dollars in it or something like that in other words it's not designed for him he shouldn't play this year at whatever it would be, seven or eight hundred thousand dollars. I don't mean that. What I mean is, you come in right now. Let's see if it works out. And if it works out, then all of these plateaus are eminently reachable. If you are the starting quarterback of this team, that is what. If if I were the Steelers, I'd be willing to do that. You just finished paying your quarterback a jillion dollars every year for the last, whatever, 10 years, Roethlisberger. I mean, you're going to end up paying a quarterback less, significantly less. Uh, So my point is, come in without, uh, don't come in thinking you're getting a $10 million signing bonus or something like that. Just come in, and if it works out, then you make a lot of money. I just don't see it happening as a practical matter because of the 30% alienation of the fan base that yeah. goes along with it. And and to those of you wondering why we spent so much time talking about this today, first of all, I think we've presented many useful angles that haven't been discussed in a while about this. And secondly, we saw the drop in the quarterback market from Russell Wilson to Carson Wentz in one day. There aren't many good options out there, and once again, Mason Rudolph is currently at the top of the depth chart in Pittsburgh. And I think anyone who is capable of any objectivity would say that from a quarterback standpoint, even with five years on the couch, Colin Kaepernick is better than Mason Rudolph. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.